Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And we're going to continue looking at uh, this genealogy of the priests, uh, dealing with Eli and his descendants. Uh, but before we do, uh, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence as we open your word together. We are thankful for the opportunity we have each day to come before you and receive of your spirit, to receive strength and insight and preparation for the day ahead. We know, Lord, that many challenges lie before us, and we are insufficient to meet those challenges without you. So we just ask that as we study your word together, as we fellowship with you and one another, uh, that we can be strengthened. And we pray for those who study these things, that you can lead and guide them. We ask, Lord, that you can show us our sins and our need of you, and that we can depend upon you each moment. Please watch over our family and friends and those that we come in contact. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so yesterday we were finishing off with a, a discussion regarding the, which something I had not looked in before, into before, was the genealogy of the priests and uh, some little interesting details that uh, that we will find as we look at this. Just a uh, note that today is the 18th day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar. So, you know, one of those symbolic dates. Now, when we dealt with uh, Eli, it was these verses that addressed these judgments that are are given uh, to Eli. And let me see here. So I just got to get back here. So that was chapter two. We're dealing with like verses 30 to 36. Oops. Go in place. Okay, that's why. Uh, so I'll just read this again. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. And thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation in all uh and so, in, well, in all the wealth which God should give Israel, we're saying all that which would be to Israel. And there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to repeat that idea about the old man in thine house. But in the second time, it's going to say forever. And the man of thine, whom I shall not cut off from mine altar, shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart. And all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. So that means they're not going to live to be old, right? And this shall be a sign unto thee that thou shall come upon that shall come upon thy two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and in one day they shall die both of them. So we got these two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. One is uh, uh, means the pugilist, and another one means the mouth of the serpent. And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and shall say, Put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's offices, that I may eat a piece of bread. So that means there's some in his house that are not in a priest's office, they're in pendury, right? they're poor, and... Um, so we we then discussed a little bit, well, how do we look at this genealogy? Now, so this I got um, off the Internet. I didn't make this chart here. And and the references are the references uh, that we have those numbers. Ithamar, Eli, Ichabod, they have like one, two, three. Those are just the references, the scriptural uh, references that we can use to establish this. Okay, so. Uh, we're going to look at each of these, and we'll notice some things. So we're not that concerned about Ithamar, right? We're now focusing more on Eli, so we're not going to look at every single reference here. 
but uh, I put them all here and, and they're in the document. I'm going to share the document. I'm going to put it up on academia with these additional notes in it. So we know about Eli being the high priest when Samuel was born. We've already looked at first Samuel, right? So that's not going to be an issue. And we haven't, uh, so we got in first Samuel one verse 21, it's, that's the reference it gives us. And I'm not sure why it gives us that reference. So that doesn't seem to be correct. Because Ichabod is not going to be in that. So I'm going to correct that. Somehow they got a, it's 4 verse 21. Okay. So they made a typo. I don't know how, some, how people do that. I thought I was the only one. Okay. So in 1 Samuel 4, verse 21, we haven't got there yet, but uh, we, we're going to have, uh, she named the child Ichabod, saying the glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken and because her father-in-law, because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said the glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken. It's in verse 22. Okay, so um, we're, we're going to come to that and study that. I mean, most of us are familiar with it already. So Ichabod, it shows that his line, it doesn't show anything from his line. Now, does that mean Ichabod does not have descendants or just that they're not mentioned? More like they're just not mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and it could be that his descendants are the ones that are in penury, right? That are poor. Is that possible? Because they're not part of the priesthood, and a high tub's descendants are. Would that make sense? Like we're 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 guessing here, but You're right, we're guessing. Yeah, but does that make make sense based upon that that curse upon the descendants? Because that's not going to be true of the descendants of Phinehas that are mentioned, right? So you have a high tub and then a high John Ahimelech and Abiathar, Jonathan. So these are all ones who are descendants of Phinehas. So they, they seem not to be, it doesn't seem like it applies to them. It would have to apply to Ichabod's children, descendants. Any thoughts on that? I mean, well, if we, if we look at another situation, we know that, there was a a group of people that were attacking the children of Israel, attacking the weak and the infirm. And finally, in the time of Saul, God gave orders for their destruction, right? Mm -hmm. Yet, in, in this situation, when Samuel slew Agag, which Saul was supposed to have done, yeah, the king of the Amalekites. The king of the Amalekites. We are given the impression that the Amalekites were destroyed. Yet when we come to the study of Esther, we know that Haman was a descendant of Agag. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we're not told all of the points. And mm -hmm. so there, there's... A couple of different ways that things could go with Ichabod. Yes, his descendants could be, you know, as you're saying, in penury, very poor. Mm -hmm. It could also be that he just didn't have any descendants. Yeah, yeah. But somebody's, some of their his descendants are going to be poor. So it makes sense that since Ichabod doesn't have any line shown that it could be his descendants. But I don't know for certain. Okay. So it's just a, an inference. Okay. Yeah. So now then the thing that we have here, you're going to see there's uh, an high tub that's, so I'm just trying to figure out how this, this chart is working. So there is another Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, who also has a son of high tub. Is that what this chart shows? That's what it would look to show. Yeah, which could probably explain why I get confused when it comes to uh, Bible names and stuff. <laughs> I'm bad enough with names. 
I know the one course in university that I didn't do well in was uh, uh, I took uh, a, a course on uh, the gods of the Middle East, you know, Middle Eastern, uh, you know, mythology or whatever. And I, I could not get all the names straight of all the different uh, Egyptian and uh, Syrian and Hittite and all those different gods. I couldn't get all those names straight. Terrible with names. So the part of it was most of the names started with A or M. <laughs> so, it was, it, so I'm just not good at that. But um, anyway, with the high tub, it's going to give us this reference, the, the son of Phineas. So um, let me see here. So they got um, First Chronicles 6, verse 7 to 8. Um, so this is going to be, well, it goes even further back. I would have given more. Um, but anyway, it goes through the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, and the sons of Kohath, Amram, Ishtard, Hebron, and Uziel, and the children of Amram, Aaron, Moses, Miriam, right? On the sons of Aram are Nadab, and Vihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar. Now, is Eliezer... Is going to begat Phinehas, Phinegat, Abishua, Abishua begat Buki, or Buki begat Uzi, Uzi begat Zerahiah, Zerahiah begat Marioth, Marioth begat Amariah, Amariah begat Ahitub, Ahitub begat Zadok, Zadok begat Ahimez, right? So we're going to see all the way back here we have Ahitub. So that's going to be. Well, I'm not, I might want to count all the generations. It doesn't show you all the generations or all the names here, but I mean, it does in First Chronicles. But we can see that that uh, Phinehas is is earlier, right? And then, so this is not like a direct son, where we do have another Phinehas with a, a son that directly is descended from him. That is a high tub. So that that just becomes confusing for me. Uh, we also in First Chronicles 18, verse 16. Is that what it says? 18, verse 16, yep. And Zadok, the son of Ahitub, and Abimelech, the son of Abiathar, were priests. And, and then we need to look at this one, which is interesting. So 2 Samuel 8, verse 17. What do we see in that 2 Samuel 8, verse 17? We've got the 187. Yeah, and the two. Right. <laughs> right. Um, now, I noticed this at uh, 718 this morning. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Now, there is a mistake in the scriptures. So if we looked at. Um, so in Second Samuel 8, verse 17, it says. So I'll go here. I'll show you. It says, and Zadok, the son of Ahitab, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, were the priests, and Sariah was the scribe. So what's what's wrong with this verse? There's a transposition of two names. So they're in the wrong order? Yeah. Because Abiathar is the son of Ahimelech, right? Agreed. Okay, so if we go... Back here, because we have here, and Abimelech, the son of Abiathar, in First Chronicles 18, 16. And you know, this says the same thing. Abimelech, the son of Abiathar, were the priests. It's basically the same thing. So that also has the same mistake. And where we would find it correctly um, is... In 1 Samuel 22, Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. Let me see here. It's not where I want to find it. I had this before. Um, okay, it's going to tell us. Ahimelech, the son of Ith Ithamar. Okay, anyway, they get it reversed. Um, I just can't find the verse I was looking at. Did they show it? Anyway, so why is it reversed? So so we're going to say that it's an error because Abiathar is the son of Ahimelech, according to uh, 
it, it's well, let me see where's the other verse yeah so it's it's in first chronicles 24 6 that's where i need to go yeah so ahimelech the son of abiathar uh again let me see here so this one has this no that's an ahimelech was mistakenly transformed just i can't remember where i find it so anyway we should we have these places where it says Ahimelech is the son of Abiathar, but Abiathar is the son of Ahimelech. Oh, no, I can't find it. So it keeps saying Ahimelech is the son of Abiathar, but Abiathar is the son of Ahimelech. Let me see if I can find it. I guess, yeah, it's in 1 Samuel 22. Just don't, I can't find the exact verse. Okay, so what would be, okay, if it's inverted, which which I'm suggesting it is, what would that tell us? Yeah, it's in 1 Samuel 22, 20. And one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar showed David that Saul had slain the Lord's priests. And David said unto Abiathar, I knew it that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul and have occasioned the death of all the persons of my father's house. Okay, so, I mean, we'll look at that in detail later on. So why do these verses get the names inverted? What would that tell us? Because we have noticed times that there are uh, things in Scripture that, you know, because Ellen White says there there are places where in the trans transmission of the scriptures where minor errors would arise. But I have found that they always have a purpose. So what would be the purpose of inverting these two? So um, so we have it in 1 Chronicles 24, verse 6, that Ahimelech's the son of Abiathar, but it's actually Abiathar is the son of Ahimelech. And we have it in 18.16, Again, Abimelech, the son of Abiathar. And in 2 Samuel 8, 17. So we have three places that we have these names inverted. Any suggestions? Okay. Ahimelech, wasn't he a priest that served in the town of Nob? Yeah, I, I believe so. That we, we just read that. Now, you know, it could be that we have some, some misunderstanding in, in who these people are. But we know from Second uh, Samuel 22, verse 20, etc., that that Abiathar is the son of Ahimelech, and there it's not just a list; it's actually describing something. So it's giving a bit more of a narrative, which is more likely that that is correct if they're referring to the same two people. But we have three verses that give us this the transposition of these names. And one of them is 2 Samuel 8, 17. So it has all the numbers of July 18, 2020. So, so Kelly's asking, you know, is this a mistake or is God trying to tell us something? I always say it's God's trying to tell us something. What, what would God be trying to tell us with this? Well, if we look at the name meaning, Ahimelech, yeah. Ahimelech would be brother of the king. Would that not be correct? Uh, father, uh, yeah, brother of the king? Yeah, let me see. I know Malik is king. I'm not sure about the prefix there. So let me see. Yeah. Okay, I see what the, the just the prefix is the uh, first part of the the name. Yeah, so brother of the king. That's simply, yeah, so that's why it's it's Ach is the, the root. It's just how they translate Ach. Yeah. Ahimelech. Okay. Could mean that somebody who appears to look like either a literal, literal relationship, metaphorical affinity, affinity or re resemblance. That is, he looks like the king. And then we have Abiathar, which means father of abundance. Right. But Abiathar is the only deposed high priest. Is that not correct? At least in this, in this portion of the Bible. Mm hmm. Yeah. It's going to be replaced with Zadok. 
by S Solomon, he's going to depose him, right? It says here in our notes, the priesthood returned to the house of Eliezer to Zadok, who for a time had been co-high priest with Abiathar. And that's listed in uh, uh, Josephus Antiquities uh, 754. So it's, I think, book seven, chapter five, page or paragraph four, I think is what that means. Okay. So we have this, you know, this interposition, this transposition of these two names switched around, right? And you have this list like Zadok's the son of a high tub and a high tub. Um, and so we have these two Zadok, the son of a high tub and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar were the priests. So we're going to have Zadok as this co-priest, co-high priest. Not sure exactly what that means and why they have two high priests. But we know that it should be a Abiathar, the son of Himelech. And if you think about it, Zadok, the son of Ahitab, and Himelech, the son of Abiathar, were the priests. Well, obviously, it's Abiathar, the son of Himelech, who is the priest. So they. So what does this mean that these names are transposed, that they're switched around? Because it, 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 it should be some kind of typo, but it's consistent. There's three times that we see in Scripture that they they have it the other way around. And it should be obvious to anyone reading it that it should be the other way around based upon uh, the context of the story of how it unfolds. So we got Eli, Phinehas, Ahitab, Ahimelech, and Abiathar. So from Eli, we have four generations leads to Abiathar. But these two are going to be here just literarily uh, switched around as some kind of okay so does and, and i'm going to look here at the hebrew as well just to see what the hebrew says but it's in this verse that's an important verse right like from a symbolic point of view second samuel 8 17 and they have here ahimelech the son of abiathar i mean they could have maybe said that, you know, it was Ahimelech Abiathar's, uh, let me see, so Ahimelech, I don't know how you would translate that, it's just the word order would, Ahimelech's son Abiathar, but in the other verse, it, it we can see we got Zadok, the son of a high tub, right, and so the word order would then be the same, but they got the names switched around any ideas we're gonna we're gonna take that this is applying in some way to july 18 2020 that something has been switched around no no kelly it's the weight of evidence does not suggest that the three are correct and samuel is incorrect so by the very fact that we know abiathar is the one that is the high priest with zadok and not ahimelech it, it would be obvious to anybody reading it that it would be the other way around, right? So in, in the whole story, it's going to be a Viathar who has the priesthood taken away from him. So I, I understand what you're saying, but it's, this would be correct, um, that it's, it's a Viathar, right? So Kelly had asked a question in the chat there. So a Viathar and Zadok are the priests at that time. So it's not a Himalek, the son of Abiathar, who's the co-high uh, priest. So we have some symbols here, right? So we have, um, there's going to be a change in the priesthood at that time, right? Abiathar is going to be removed. It's part of this curse that's given to Eli. It's going to be in the fourth generation from Eli, right? Phinehas, Ahitab, Ahimelech, and Abiathar. Right. But in these three verses, they're going to have them switched around. OK, so we have abundant father coming in a line that is not going to be a. A long line. Yeah. Is this referring in the movement to the change from Elder Jeff to that which is going to occur with the 144,000. 
Mm-hmm. That's that's the way that I take it. That it's, you know, say this that it's it's meant for us. Not that that's the only thing it's meant for, but it's meant for us to see something regarding July 18, 2020, that there is a change that occurs, that something is interpo- interposed, right? Right. Time was changed around, however we want to we want to say it. So God has has allowed this as a symbol that we can look at dealing with what happened with July 18, 2020. And so I, I don't know if that makes sense to everyone, but it fits in with what we already have understood. It's just an interesting detail because w- when we look at this, this has to do, of course, you know, we're saying that Eli represents leadership that could represent, of course, the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is in a bigger line. But we know when we look at a fractal, we can see just as, you know, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was passed by within the movement, we have the same sort of thing happen. So when Jeff is is arguing that he should never have listened to all these other voices since 2012, that we shouldn't have gone in the direction with Ezra 7-9 and all the symbolic use of numbers, and that July 18, 2020 was a mistake, but yet, ironically, he still says it's the first disappointment, which makes no sense if we're going to parallel, parallel Millerite history. And then he wants people to come back to now follow him again after his his failures, right, which he admitted, there would definitely be a parallel here, that there's a change in the priesthood that occurs. And that becomes symbolized with this verse and and switching of these two names, this we would call maybe a typographical error, but it's repeated in three places. Though so we would have to say that they are copied from the same source, right? But it would be really obvious to anybody copying them that it's it's obviously incorrect, which which I find interesting. They would all know Abiathar is actually the high the co high priest at the time of Zadok, not Ahimelech. Does anybody have questions about that? Does that seem Seem unclear. Now, I mean, the best way to sort of look at this is to see this zoom out where Eli represents the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, we have these two, these two uh, priests, Hophni and Phinehas, who are going to be killed, right? We also have uh, when Eli dies that the Ark is going to be taken. And we, we haven't got into these stories yet. But we, we need to keep these in the back of our minds as we move ahead. So we need to have this, this understanding of this chronology, of this genealogy, and what it would symbolize. So we say Ichabod, the glory of departing, is 9-11 with the death, we'll say, of the Seventh-day Adventist church structure or organization. And then we have, uh, but we have still this line We'll call it, you know, these generations, a high tub, a Himalek, a Biathar, that are a continuation of where this this uh, this has passed, right? And then we have this the the switching of these two in three verses, a Himalek and a Biathar. But we also have Zadok too, right? So Zadok would represent something. Now, does everybody know what Zadok means? So is this righteous or just? Yeah. Righteous. Yeah. Zadok means righteousness. Now, it comes from the Strong's number 6663. So there's, this is 6659. And so we have the righteous, right? So the righteous... There's also the, the fact that Abiathar is removed. Yeah. Yeah, say that means just or righteous. So as we as we go through this story, we just want to get it all in our head, how this geneal- genealogy works and how this narrative is going to unfold and how how we are going to parallel it. Okay. Any further thought on these notes here? Is what you said two different documents. 
Correct. What? Uh, so one is just an article? No, one, I did a word search on... On the word ruler. Correct. Okay. It's a short document. Okay. Maybe we'll look at that one first. Does that make sense? That's fine. Just I don't know the purpose of it yet, so... Okay, now the... When, when we're talking with different versions of scripture, what does MT stand for? Masoretic text. So it's from the Masoretic text that have the corrupted text of Ahimelech and Abiathar. So, yeah, so the Masoretic text inverts them. Right. But you're saying that that's not the case in other texts? It's not the case in in others. It's correct. Yeah. So sure. what other texts do we have? I mean, we have the Septuagint, so they would have it the right way, the LXX, right? Right. I would assume so, yes. Yeah. And, and that's because it's a very obvious error, right? Like, it's, it's not like, but for some reason, the Masoretic text has the error in three places. Right. So, so I think there's significance in that. Okay, so why did you do this search on ruler, a ruler in Israel? When, when I was going through this, I had worked on 1 Samuel 3 a couple of weeks ago to get it ready. And then I was impressed that there were some things that could be revealed for both 1 Samuel 3 and 1 Samuel 4 based upon how we went through the study in the first chapter. Now, most of this comes from different articles from Signs of the Times. So I found it intriguing as to how Mrs. White was approaching this. So when I came to paragraph eight, mm -hmm. The position of Joshua differed in some respects from that of Moses. Not only was the latter a prophet and a ruler in Israel, but he officiated in the capacity of high priest and asked counsel directly of God himself. Now, when she's saying the latter, she's referring to Moses. Yeah. But after Moses, neither Joshua nor any of the rulers of Israel were permitted to come to the Lord, except through the high priest. Now, throughout, I had always looked at this with Moses as being set aside and that Aaron was the high priest. But yet here, Mrs. White is making it very clear that not only was Moses the leader, which he then handed to Joshua, but that Moses was also high priest. So Moses and Aaron must have been joint high priests then, which would yeah. support what you're talking about here with Zadok and Ahimelech. A high, uh, would, wouldn't be a high. I'm no, sorry. Not a high, uh, a Bithar. Okay. <laughs> My mistake. So that's the Masoretic text mistake. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now so that gives that gives a part of what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. In letter one sixty six of nineteen oh one, we are told that the case of Eli is before us as an admonition and a warning. Eli was a fond father. He saw the course his sons were taking, but he failed to punish them. He, they did wickedly, and he restrained them not. He knew that evil existed in the camp of Israel. He knew that his sons were committing terrible sins, but he did not face the situation firmly and bravely. His blind affection for his sons kept him from punishing them as he should. The sure result was an increase of iniquity. So Eli's situation, Eli being the high priest, 
Eli occupying the same office as did Moses. When he's confronted with sin, he didn't follow the example that Moses had followed within the camp of Israel. He followed his own counsel. Sin was found in Eli because of his neglect. Now, I took this as a very personal warning. Knowing of the evil course his sons were following, he should have removed them from the service of God. He should have seen that just punishment was dealt out to them. But he was not firm and decided in his efforts to eradicate the moral leprosy. He permitted evil to gain strength and iniquity to increase. He neglected his duty and Israel was contaminated by the course of his sons. The Lord gave Eli a special instruction to deal with this evil as a ruler of Israel. But Eli did not do his duty. Warning after warning was heeded. And at last God refused to pardon the transgressors. And not only were the sons to receive according to their deeds, the parents were to suffer also. Neither sacrifice nor offering would be accepted by God. The word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. In that day, I will perform against Eli all the things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity that he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. And we're going to see this as we get further into 1 Samuel chapter 3. Yeah. The sad history of Eli's punishment and neglect has been recorded as a lesson for all parents to show the importance of purity in speech and practice and the importance of firmly restraining children. Those parents who neglect to take decided measures for the restraint of evil in their children will be punished as surely as Eli was punished. Now, the last one that's referred to as ruler in this situation was Samuel. The government of Israel had never been conducted with so great wisdom and success as under Samuel's sole administration. In no previous ruler had the people reposed so implicit confidence. He had labored with untiring and disinterested zeal for the highest good of the nation. In every transaction, he had been governed by justice and benevolence. And not only was his course wholly unselfish, but he was often inattentive to his own dues and rights. Hence, the selfishness manifested by his sons appeared more striking in, contact, in contrast with the course of their faithful father. The arrogance and injustice of these judges caused much dissatisfaction among the people who were far more troubled by dangers threatening their temporal interests than they had been by the profligacy and sacrilege of Hophni and Phinehas. They were more worried about the Philistines than they were about the sin within the temple. Ere long, many who considered themselves aggrieved presented their complaints to the elders of Israel. A pretext was thus furnished for urging the change which had long been secretly desired. In other words, to leave behind the administration of the Almighty for that of an earthly king. So I found it intriguing when when I went through this, reading the way that, that Mrs. White had written it, that Moses was seen as a ruler. Joshua was seen as a ruler. Eli was seen as a ruler. And Samuel was seen as a ruler. Mm -hmm. The only one that is the odd one in that entire group is Joshua because he was not of the tribe of Levi. Mm -hmm. But 
having having this showing Moses and Aaron both being high priest was for me intriguing. Yeah. I mean, this just brings lots of thoughts, but um, exactly how to sort them all out. Right. Um, okay. i got to open up this new one. Is that one? Um, what does the A mean? You name the file. Okay. When, when I'm setting these, when I'm setting files up, I want, I go through this, I set the entire file original without any kind of subscript. So that's normally the ones that have strictly the, the biblical references from the 1769 Bible. Okay. When I have a version A, it includes the spirit of prophecy. Okay. And then there are times that after I have completed a document, I will find other things that are germane to the to that study. And so I may have an A1, an A2, you know, whatever. Okay. Okay. So, okay. That's helpful. Now let me see here. There we go. So First Samuel chapter 3. Uh, so this is the summary that's given or the of, of what it's going to be about. Now there's an interesting question in the chat. Yeah, the co yeah by Angela there about the the co reign of Darius and Cyrus and you got Moses and Aaron. Right. Yeah, I, I thought about that. Just sometimes there's two people at the beginning of a reform line. Not always, but sometimes there is. But that can be the marker of the beginning of a reform line. But as we go through that, we'll have to keep that in mind. Any other thoughts on that? Not at this moment. Okay. Okay. Um, so the manner in which the word of the Lord was first revealed to Samuel, God showed to Samuel the destruction of Eli's house. Samuel adjured by Eli, telleth him the vision. And Samuel is favored by God and acknowledged for a prophet in Israel. Right. So, I mean, most of us are familiar with this story. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Um, now, how do we often apply this? There was no open vision in, in Adventist history. When E.G. White quit, quit having, having an open vision, it was 1884. Am I wrong? Am I correct? Yeah, I'm trying to think of the year. So she's going to have her first open vision. In, in and her last open vision in Portland, Oregon. Uh, Oregon, right? I think it was 1884. Yeah, I think so. You're, you're correct. But yeah. the, the other part of this is if you look at the Hebrew, there was no open calzone. Okay. Yeah. So that was the next question. So. So that means the Kazone vision, which is a reference to the 2520. Correct. Was not, not known. So it's not open. So, I mean, the thing is we can look at this story on different levels, right? So we can zoom in, zoom out. But if we're going to address this uh, in regard to, uh, to the church, we, we can definitely mark this as, um, at the time of 9-11, there is no open vision, right? Or even before that, right? But the understanding of the 2520 had not yet come to this mes message, to this movement, until after 9-11. But, but we can look at that, that that's unfolding in this movement. So God is going to gradually unfold to this movement on understanding that's going to lead to the understanding of the 2520, right? Correct. Now, the, the other part of that, and this is something that, that has been addressed multiple times, when the church is pure, all of the gifts of the spirit will be active, right? Yeah. So at this point, with the high priest 
with everything else going on, I think the premise can be established that the church was not pure because of what was going on within Eli's house. And it's kept upon all of Israel. Now, of course, God unfolds, I mean, because none of us are pure and no one has a house that's pure. Even if we look at the School of the Prophets or we look at FFA, we can definitely, looking back, we can see that God was giving us light in spite of ourselves. Right. He was, giving, he was giving light from from unexpected places as right. it would be the movement. Right. Now, I'm always still amazed at that. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of amazed at the part that I personally had in what happened. Because, you know, it's just, you know, it's not like, you know, I was part of the movement, really, right? I mean, I wasn't a part of FFA and, you know, sort of on the periphery. And yet, you know, Jeff listened to things that I had to share, right? He wanted to hear those things. But I wasn't well accepted. Like, I, I never felt accepted by, even by Jeff, really, you know, as a person. Right. He, he seemed to be interested in the things I was sharing, but not interested in me as in, in me as an individual. And I'm not sure particularly why what he didn't like about me. I, I, I sort of assume it's because of my sort of I wasn't I wasn't the type of character that seemed like the type that he he trusted. He tended to like, you know, more type A personalities. But but that's just my guess. I don't know for certain exactly why things unfolded the way they did. But, uh, you know, light came to this movement in this sort of unexpected way. And and light has come to the Seventh-day Adventist Church in an unexpected way. Right. That's the way God works. You know, one of the things that uh, we saw that Jeff admitted a mistake in is when he had you know, pass the cloak, so to speak, over to Parminder. He recognized that it wasn't his to give. Uh, do people remember that? Jeff saying that? That it wasn't, it really wasn't yeah. to be his decision. But oh, yeah. He made and, you know, I thought that was rather insightful, though he seems to have not recognized that that really what God wanted to do was to take the work into his own hands. That, it, that we were supposed to be under the leadership of Christ, not under the leadership of some organization or a group of people, of elders or whatever, right? That, that's the way that I understood that God wanted to work at the end. So, you know, I was personally disappointed with the direction that, the, that FFA was going in organization. I, I didn't think it was the right thing to do, but I also didn't feel it was my place to to tell them what to do. I remember when when I was there in Heidi and I were there in 2018. There was a a meeting. Tyler was leading out in it. Um, uh, and now Parminder wasn't there, so this was before, before Parminder and. And Tess showed up. Well, maybe Tess was there. I'm trying to think. Yeah, she was there. She was there right from the beginning. Parminder wasn't there. I'm not sure why. I think I'm trying to remember. I could be. I could be wrong. I think actually it was in 2017. I don't think Heidi was there. It was in 2017. Tyler was leading out in some meetings uh, regarding organization. Um, I don't remember. Anyway. In these meetings, you know, I was fairly vocal and and pointing them to all kinds of spirit of prophecy quotes. And and basically, the group that was there, which would have been about 30 people or so, uh, they came to see things much the way that I understood them, because I just basically presented spirit of prophecy regarding organization. And yet, you know, once Parminder showed up, all of that was undone. With just, you know, without without spirit of prophecy quotes or anything like that, without Bible support, just in Parminder say so. And so, you know, this is something that 
that really to understand God's leadership, that this is something that God does, that we do need to wait upon the Lord for him to accomplish his work. Now, we also have a part to play in obedience and um, in sharing, you know, his word with others, right, in sharing the light that God has given us. But we so often take the work into our own hands, thinking that we can accomplish what God says that only he can accomplish. We saw this with A.T. Jones. He basically saw that things weren't happening the way he believed they should, so he took the work into his own hands. And and, and he caused, he actually caused the very thing that he was trying to stop, that is the rejection of the message of righteousness by faith. Now, it was, you could say it was already rejected, but if, if Jones had acted differently, the history of this church would be very different. You know, if Jones and Wagner both had remained faithful in their faith in God and trusting that God was going to accomplish what he had promised, we wouldn't be in the situation we are today. So, um, so you know, another thing uh, just to sort of connect this. So we say there was no open vision. So we know that we have... Ellen White's uh, first open vision and her last open vision. Now, we also know that the 1863 chart was first presented in Newport. Now, it wasn't Rhode Island. What's the other place? Newport. So, you people know what I'm talking about? There's a camp meeting James White went to with the first copies of the 1863 chart, and it's going to be in Newport that we're going to have the first people being disfellowshipped over the 2520. I think uh, you're getting something mixed up. The first come meeting of the charts. The 1863 charts. Sorry, the 1863 chart. Yeah, talking about the 1863 chart, not the 1843. Right, okay. So, so we look at the 1863 chart as a rejection of the 2520. Um, so it's 1863. I've typed it in the wrong place here. <laughs> okay. What's the place? Newport. What's the other Newport? It's not Newport, Rhode Island. Where, where's the town of Newport? Is it Newport, Maine? Wherever the camp meeting was? I think maybe that would have been where it was. Anyway, so we're going to have the 1863 chart, the first time that it's presented as a camp meeting in Newport, but not Newport, Rhode Island. And um, and then we're going to have the first disfellowshipping. So that, that has to do with the rejection of the 2520. And, and so we connect that with Portland, Maine, and Portland, Oregon, again, as a symbol. Now, it's Newport, Newport. Newport's in in Oregon or Washington? I always forget. Dwight, are you there? Where's Newport? Or anybody else? I did in the wrong spot again. I think it's uh, uh, Newport, Washington. Yeah, it's Washington, right? Okay. So so we had Portland, and yeah, we had Portland, Maine, I guess, and and Portland, Oregon, and then we had Newport, Maine, and Newport, Washington. That must be correct. Sure, lots of Newports. Just look here on Wikipedia, all the places called Newport. There is a Newport, Oregon. No, it is Oregon. There is no Newport, Washington. Oh, no, there is a Newport, Washington. So whichever place it was, I, I'm not sure where Newport is. Dwight would know, but uh, he doesn't appear to be there. So, so we have, anyway, this symbol of the 2520. So the rejection of the 2520 is connected, connected to there being no open vision. Does that make sense to people? Yeah, I don't know if Vermont, I don't know. I would have to find that again. I always know I'd get it wrong. So we have no open vision at that time. And so we have those connections. 
Another warning was to be given to Eli's house. God could not communicate with the high priest and his sons. Their sins, like a thick cloud, had shut out the presence of his Holy Spirit. But in the midst of, the, of evil, the child Samuel remained true to heaven, and the message of condemnation to the house of Eli was Samuel's commission as a prophet of the Most High. So we, we take the message of Sam, we take Samuel as a symbol of the message of July 18, 2020, as a rebuke or a condemnation of both the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we can, but also in connection with this movement. Now, it came to pass at that time when he was, Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. So any symbols in this verse? Is anybody there? Well, that's you, 15, 14, where Christ said, blind leaders of the blind, not to listen to the Pharisees. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so so his inability to see, right? And so this is just a comment uh, that somebody's made, which I think is kind of interesting. So the passage should be rendered thus. And it came to pass at that time that Eli was sleeping in his place. Right, so he came to lay down in his place. He's sleeping. And his eyes had begun to grow dim. He could not see. And the lamp of God was not yet gone out. And Samuel was sleeping in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. And the Lord called Samuel, etc. Eli's old age and dimness of sight is probably mentioned as the reason why Samuel thought Eli had called him. Being a blind and feeble old man, he was likely to do so if he wanted anything, either for himself or for the service of the temple. Now, in regarding to, let me see here. So, so Eli, do we know how old Eli is, Stephen? I mean, he's, but I mean, it makes sense that he's old and that he can't see. So, does he represent the church in some way, Dwight? Yes, I would agree. Okay, Stephen, uh, you're 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 sort of half muted. It's kind of weird. Okay, it doesn't show that you're unmuted for some reason. So I'm not hearing you. Oh, he disappeared. You must have had a bad connection. So we we could say that about the church. What about the leadership in this movement? Like one of the things we find is that. Uh, it's Newport, New Hampshire, that they uh, went to the camp meeting. I know I always get the wrong one. So there's lots of Newport, Newport, New Hampshire, uh, where the charts are first presented. Okay. So one of the things that I find is that the light that's going to come, and it's particularly after 2012. So Jeff has also noted this. Stephen, you had a comment? He kind of disappeared there. So, um, yeah, so we know that Eli dies when he's 90 years. And at this year time, I think, yeah, okay. when he dies, but he's not 90 yet here. No. So this is when Samuel is 12. Okay. And I think it's going to be another few years before uh, he's, Eli actually dies. So I think yeah. he'll be in his 90s. Okay. Maybe 95. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that, Stephen. Yeah, I knew you would know. Okay. Thanks. So as far as uh, with Jeff in 2012, and, and we, we've placed this, this story dealing, you know, in chapter two, dealing with this movement from 2012 to 2021. And so it's in 2012, Jeff is going to do uh, Habakkuk's two tables. Um, the first one, when they first put it up on their YouTube page, was actually on June 22nd that they first put up the first presentation on Habakkuk's two tables. Later on, they took that down, they removed it, and they re reposted all of the Habakkuk's two tables. And I'm not sure particularly why they did that, but Initially, it, though the first meeting was not in June, it was earlier, but they didn't put them on the YouTube page until June 22nd was the number one of Habakkuk's two tables, the first time they posted it. You, you can't find that anymore, though, because they 
you know, we changed it. But do you have thoughts? Yeah, William. Um, I was going to say, could you uh, link the blindness with uh, Zedekiah and uh, Kings, the last king? Align it with what? I didn't catch that. William, I didn't catch what you said. Oh, I said, can you um, link the blindness of Eli with the king of, um, last king of Zedekiah, the last king? Of Israel. So line up Zedekiah with Eli? Right. I'm not sure how I would do that. I, I don't think that I would. Okay. Okay. So that's interesting, um, Kelly, just that, that quote that you have there. Now, what's WV? Where's that quote from? Because this quote says, on October 21st, Having obtained a large trunk full of finished charts, the Whites left Maine for the Newport, New Hampshire, meeting by way of Boston. Their itinerary took them by train, stages, and private conveyance to meet various appointments. They were both in good health and good spirits. Right, so they got these large trunk full of finished charts. So that's October 21st um, in 1863. Right, so. Today is October 21st, so it's just kind of interesting. Kelly, um, do you know where that's from? You, you, Kelly, WV, what is that? Page 99. Just trying to figure it out. It says uh, EGW 2000 WV. Where are you getting it? On the Ellen White site. That's Woman, Woman of Vision. There you go. That's, that's what it is. Okay. Okay, yes. now here, here's yeah, another Ellen, point. Ellen okay, White will okay. here, Here's another point, just that's to me interesting. Okay. As you noted, this is the 21st of October. Yeah, and it's the 18th day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar. And in 1863. The 21st of October was the eighth day of the seventh month. Okay. So 10 days different. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, we're taking our time picking through this and looking at all these details. But, I mean, to me, it's pretty significant, the condition of Eli, that he's he's really old. He's probably got uh, cataracts or something like that. And... It, it would represent sort of the spiritual blindness of the leadership. Now, if we tried to apply this to the church, that's pretty easy to do in the context of the 2520 and that this new message comes to uh, correct the church. But we also see this within the movement itself, that, that the light that now is coming to the movement is not going to come from Jeff directly. He's, he's going to have, all white coming from all different quarters. Now he's going to be there and, and acknowledge that it's light, but he's not going to be the originator of light after 2012. That is, I don't know of anything that Jeff particularly brings to the movement um, that isn't initiated by someone else. Like he might notice some things that, other people didn't notice, but there's going to be this light coming. Now, also remember in Oklahoma in 2010 that Jeff was receptive to light. And I remember him, the last presentation he did where he's presenting on the whiteboard and uh, someone in the, in the congregation notices something. And Jeff says, see, this is the, the sprinkling of the latter rain. Right. So he was able to accept light from someone else. Now, Jeff has taken the position that he never should have accepted light from other people. That's his recent position, which which, of course, is wrong. And, and why is that wrong? What, what's wrong with the idea that Jeff has that he should never have accepted light that came from others? I mean, it's so obviously wrong. You know, saying that he's the prophet and the light should have all come from him. God should have basically spoken to him directly and he but, should have. 
only the flood. Yeah, Dwight. That would be that'd be the same thing as Eli saying that all light should have come from him because he was the high priest. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's you know, God chooses who he will give light. You know, now Jeff could recognize it was light. So the fact that he recognized it as light and then later rejects it is not a really good um position. If he had rejected it as light right from the beginning, that'd be one thing. Now, the thing is he accepted some things as light that weren't and some things as light that were, but they were all interconnected. Even the things that were incorrect were were part of light that God was giving. That is, he was allowing, you know, Parminder presents time setting, for instance, and yet, you know, he gave witnesses against Parminder's time setting. So it just, to me, just doesn't fit, you know, the idea that, that Jeff has taken present. But anyway, our time is up. Any other final comments before we close with prayer? Not right now. Okay. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time this morning. Help us to contemplate these things. I pray that you can bless each person and the things that they are doing today. And uh, help us, Lord to to represent you in all that we come in contact with. Be with us throughout this day. Bless those watching these videos. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.